for being here on this beautiful day until a few minutes ago. <laughs> right? <laughs> it was beautiful. Uh, my, so, name is, yeah, my name is Gabriela Canero Livingston, and I serve on the board of Nebraska. Oh, sorry, Humanities Nebraska. I almost said something else. Uh, Humanities Nebraska. And it is my honor today to uh, welcome Dr. Sean Trano, who is um, a, a professor of practice in the Department of History at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. His primary research interests center on post-war uh, popular culture, science and technology, and digital photography. He received his PhD from the University of Hawaii at Manila. And um, his presentation is entitled Red Channels, Anti-Communism in 1950s Film and Television. And we would like to welcome you. Thank you everyone for that warm welcome. Uh, and just a personal note, um, I may end up sitting at some point and throw my back last week. So if I sit down, it's not because I think you're not enthusiastic enough for that. I've heard of great. Um, so yeah, we're going to talk about McCarthyism of the day, and particularly its impact in film and television. Um, you'll see why the, where the title comes from here in a few minutes, but just to clarify a little bit of vocabulary. Um, when we talk about McCarthyism, we're not just talking about anti-communism. Um, in the 1950s, 95 or 98 percent of Americans were anti-communists. They were opposed to Stalinism, opposed to uh, communist revolution in the United States. Um, but yeah, most Americans were anti-communists. When we talk about McCarthyism, we're talking about a very kind of specific form of anti-communism. Um, and we can say a few things about it. One is particularly vitriolic. Communists are painted as not just politically misguided or misinformed or something like that, but as monsters, um, you know, sadistic, cruel, etc. Uh, Number two, um, when we're talking about McCarthy, we're talking about an interest in domestic affairs. This is highly politicized. Um, so targeting people that have been members of the FDR New Deal um, or supportive of the New Deal. Um, and number three, it functions by guilt by association. So we're not talking here, there is, uh, I'll mention this briefly, um, in this period, if you were a member of the Communist Party, you were something called the Smith Act, um, particularly the leadership of the party could be arrested and sent to jail. That's not really what's going on mostly with McCarthyism. They're not investigating party members. In fact, they're kind of joke in the period of this political cartoon um, that Joseph McCarthy couldn't find a red in Red Square. <laughs> right? um, so those are some things to keep in mind. Now, as to McCarthy himself, uh, most of, he's a looming figure, that's where we get the name McCarthyism, um, but the kind of anti-communism we're talking about here extends well beyond him. So in fact, most of what I'm going to be talking about today until the very end isn't really about McCarthy personally, even though we use that term McCarthyism. So, you know, a lot of what we'll be talking about, for example, comes from HUAC, uh, the House Committee on Un-American Activities. Don't ask me why the C doesn't show up in the right place in that acronym. It's one of those great mysteries. Um, but in any case, uh, yeah, HUAC is a House Committee, right? McCarthy's a senator, so he's not involved with that. Uh, much of what I'll be talking about is uh, informal, happens between studio heads, right? So uh, the Senate isn't involved at all in that. Um, so again, when we're talking about McCarthyism, we're talking about this kind of particularly um, virulent form of anti-communism. Uh, uh, this is probably totally unreasonable, so most, it's okay, I'm mostly going to skip over this. This was just meant to give you a kind of rough timeline of stuff we're talking about. A couple of things I will say about this slide uh, to give you some sense of what's going on here. First of all, this is not the first time there's been this kind of red scare or red panic in America. Um, in the late 19s and early 1920s, there was an earlier red scare uh, where uh, many people were deported, particularly foreign nationals, anarchists, uh, that sort of thing. Um, so it's not the first time it happened. A couple of other things to point out from this unreadable slide. Uh, 1940, I already mentioned this. <laughs> there is a Smith Act uh, named after uh, uh, Congressman Smith, uh, which um, bans, makes it illegal to be a member of any group that would engage in violent, or that proclaims that it would engage in violent activity against the United States. Oops, and through sorry. some very, it's okay, through some very selective sorry, sorry, reading, sorry. 
of Karl Marx, um, guided by some former communists who will insist that uh, anytime Marx talks about revolution, he's actually encouraging a violent revolution. Um, and anytime he says anything else about working through political change or labor unions or something like that, he must be lying. Um, so there's some selective reading going on that allows them to paint the Communist Party um, as committed to immediate violent uh, revolution. And um, in the jurisprudence of the era, that's going to supersede the First Amendment. So they're going to be able to jail uh, communists or suspected communists. Uh, relevant to what we're going to be talking about today, our story really begins in 1947. Um, Act, the House Committee on American Activities, has been around for a little bit. Um, formed during World War II in 1938. Um, but in 1947, they will come to Hollywood. So we'll come back there in a minute. Um, I've already hinted at this a little bit, but to clear up a kind of common, couple of common misconceptions, and also just to make the case that I'm not a Soviet apologist, I'm not here to tell you uh, Stalin was right or something like that. Um, McCarthyism, again, is interested in a domestic threat. So if you were in this uh, earlier session this morning, you heard a lot about the Cold War. The threat from the Soviet Union was very real in the 1950s. In 1949, um, they had their first successful atomic test. Uh, they took a number of aggressive actions in Eastern Europe, which if it didn't threaten America directly, certainly threatened some of our strongest allies. Right? So the Soviet Union itself is a very real threat. There are also definitely Soviet spies in the United States. Um, famously, the, the Rosenbergs, Juliet, uh, Julius and, and uh, Ethel Rosenberg um, and Alger Hiss, who had been a uh, well placed government official. Uh, Whitaker Chambers, the editor of Time, came forward with his own volition and said he used to secretly be a communist and started naming names, um, and that he had facilitated uh, espionage activity in the United States. So there definitely were spies. Um, that's also a very real threat, but also, again, has very little to do with McCarthy. Um, McCarthy and UAC don't even claim that they are looking for spies, per se, at least not of a traditional espionage right. They're not looking for people selling secrets. Uh, instead, they're looking for something else. Not only am I not a Stalinist, um, but I'm not going to attempt to apologize for the Communist Party of the United States, either. The CPUSA was a branch of Stalin's, of Stalin's foreign policy at the beginning of the 1950s. By the end of the 1950s, they're mostly in tatters. Um, There's something like 15% of their membership by the 1950s are actually undercover FBI agents. In fact, by about 1955, uh, by 1955, you can find memos um, from uh, FBI Director Hoover uh, talking to his deputies, asking if they should rig the elections inside the Communist Party because they have so many undercover agents that they have enough to tilt the balance. <laughs> So the CPUSA, I'm not apologizing for them, but I would suggest they weren't a serious threat to the United States in any kind of meaningful sense of the word. Um, and mostly what McCarthy is going to do, and Huac, uh, and these, these other sort of characters, again, is not look for party members, but look for people who can be tied to the party through some chain of connection. Um, so perhaps, ma'am, you once attended a fundraiser uh, to help the... Uh, the, the Republicans in the Spanish Civil War to fight against the fascists. Well, it turns out a lot of communists supported the Republicans in the Spanish Civil War. So maybe you're a communist because you did the same thing they did, right? Uh, or maybe, sir, you donated money to or went to a march for the Congress on Racial Equality. It turns out communists were very big into civil rights in the 1930s and 40s. And so by supporting civil rights, maybe you yourself are a communist. Right. This is the kind of thing McCarthy is looking for. Um, finally, just one last note on the party. Um, sometimes people sort of try to justify McCarthyism retroactively by pointing to uh, pointing to those spies, right? uh, the Rosenbergs, Alder you know, Hiss, et cetera, et cetera. Um, there were some uh, people caught for espionage who had been members of the party. But generally speaking, the KGB didn't recruit people in the CPUSA. Why? Because that's the first place the FBI is going to go look at, right? Um, you want to find somebody who's placed, say, in the military or the uh, diplomatic services who is not uh, formally connected to the party. So let's begin our story here then in 1947. Um, this is the sort of first official contact between Hollywood and the forces of McCarthyism. 
1947, uh, the leaders of a number of uh, Hollywood uh, unions, so the Screen Actors Guild, the Screen Writers Guild, et cetera, et cetera, invited Kuat to come and investigate their own industry. Um, and at those hearings, mostly what you'll find are people like Ronald Reagan here on the screen, uh, who at the time, I believe, was the head of SAG, uh, the Screen Actors Guild, saying that they think they've already done a pretty good job themselves of rooting out communists from the labor unions. It's a kind of major theme in the late 1940s and early 1950s that communists might be infiltrating labor unions and um, using them to disrupt American industries. Now, before I go any further, since we're talking about film and television today, let me pause and ask, uh, besides the fact that they were invited, does anyone have any thoughts about why um, Kuak might be interested in Hollywood at all? If communists are going to disrupt some American industry, maybe it's aircraft production or fuel refineries, right? Those would be kind of clearly tied uh, to some sort of geopolitical you know, contest. Why would they care what's going on in Hollywood? Any guesses? Propaganda. Propaganda, information. Yeah, they're very much concerned about influence over the American people, right? I mean, they're going to go to be hard for propaganda. They're not going to find much, as I'll talk about in a few minutes. Um, but this is really what they're interested in, is, is the idea that there are secret, commie, sympathetic, red or pink messages built into Hollywood films or television um, that will sway the American public in support of comics. For the same reason, uh, another big target of McCarthyist inquiries are teachers, academics, um, you know, the notion that they have control over children, or raising young minds, etc., etc. Um, so who that comes to Hollywood again? Uh, most of the the leaders of these guilds uh, or unions testify that, uh, in fact, they think they've already successfully dealt with this problem. Um, they've stopped communists from producing any propaganda out of Hollywood um, or from having any leadership positions in these unions. Uh, there are, however, some people in Hollywood who are who view this as an unwarranted government intrusion. Um, in people's private business and private uh, political lives. Um, so out of these HUAC hearings, we get the Hollywood 10. Um, these are 10 screenwriters and scenarists who not only refused to cooperate, there were other people who refused to testify at these hearings. I'll talk about the way they could do that in a minute. Um, but not only did they refuse to testify, but they sort of went on the attack against HUAC. Uh, in fact, John Howard Lawson, who's up here, um, he's got this kind of famous moment in the HUAC hearings where he essentially says, uh, you think I'm on trial, but I'm putting the whole system on trial. Right? This kind of made-for-television moment. Um, and particularly what the Hollywood 10 assert is that they have a First Amendment right to, a pol to whatever po political affiliation they may like. First Amendment grants the right to freedom of speech, freedom of assembly, freedom of association. Right. Uh, and they say, even asking that question of me, asking me, Am I, do, I, do I support communism, am I sympathetic with communism, that itself is a violation of our First Amendment rights. Well, Congress doesn't buy that. And the courts essentially refuse to take up the case. Uh, and as I kind of mentioned with the Smith Act, around the same time, there are a number of cases working their way through the courts. Eventually, the Supreme Court, until about 1957, is going to take the same line. They're going to say, uh, in fact, you do not have a First Amendment right to be a member of the Communist Party. Because this party is preaching violent revolution, um, the government has a right or has the ability to outlaw membership in it. And it's like the Hell's Angels uh, or the Mafia, right? It's a criminal organization, and so we can criminalize membership in it. Um, as I said, uh, you know, the, the Congress doesn't buy their attacks, um, the courts won't take the case, uh, and so all ten of these folks go to jail. Uh, for about a year. Uh, one of them, Edward Dimitrik, uh, later changes his mind, agrees to inform the four who acts, so <coughs> names names. He says, yes, I was a member of the Communist Party um, and some other associated groups. And he tells Congress about other people in Hollywood uh, who we had seen at these meetings. Uh, he gets out of jail early and he goes back to work. The other nine people on this list are effectively blacklisted. I'll unpack that more in a minute. I mean, they can't work in the industry. 
um, under their own names. Again, these are mostly screenwriters and scenarists, so they're not appearing on camera. Um, so uh, a number of them continue to write under pseudonyms. Uh, in fact, Dalton Trumbo there at the bottom um, wins an Academy Award for the Brave Ones in 1957, which he had written under a fake name. Right. Um, so even though he is blacklisted, he's still working and, and actually writing films. Okay, so I mentioned here a second ago that uh, Congress said the First Amendment doesn't apply, and the courts uh, in 1947 were going to take off the case, but eventually the courts would agree, at least briefly. Um, they said, you do not have a First Amendment right to be a communist. But I said that other people at that UAC hearing refused to participate. Does anyone have a guess how they did that, or what other means might you have to say, I'm not going to testify before Congress? You're not protected by the First Amendment. Is there any other way you can get yourself out of that hot water? Fifth. Plead the fifth. Plead the fifth. Um, all right, ma'am, since you answered, you're going to be volunteered for this uncomfortable and awkward exercise. Are you ready? You're right. You're 100% you're right. This is, if you're called in front of Hubak, this is how you refuse to answer. You say, uh, they ask you a question, and you say, I plead the Fifth Amendment, or I invoke the Fifth Amendment, um, or I invoke my Fifth Amendment right, but you know, there's a thousand variations on this. But the key thing is here, uh, the way the law was interpreted at the time, if you started answering questions, you uh, waived your Fifth Amendment right. So, if for example, they asked you where you were last Saturday, and you said I was at a barn raising, let's say, now you're on the hook to answer all sorts of other questions, and if you start invoking the fifth after that, you can then be held in contempt of Congress. So ma'am, since you answered, you can volunteer here. And remember, you don't want to answer any questions, so you need to keep invoking the fifth. And the other thing before we do this exercise, let's remember what the fifth actually says. It says you have the right not to incriminate yourself. So anytime you invoke it, there's some suggestion you might be, there might be something incriminating there about you. All right, ma'am, are you ready for this? All right. All right. Are you now, or have you ever been a member of the Communist Party? All right, it seems pretty safe so far, right? Are you now, or have you been? She says, I plead the fifth, but let's keep going. Uh, were you at a meeting on August 5th of the Communist Party? Did you know at this meeting on August 5th that um, someone suggested bombing the Capitol building? Uh, did you witness satanic rituals take place at this meeting? Right, you can see what's going on here, right? Even though um, she hasn't given any information, right, the questions themselves suggest that there's something nefarious behind what she's doing. Um, so you are allowed 100% uh, under the law to invoke the fifth. Congress cannot compel you to answer these questions. Um, but if you refuse, you make yourself look guilty. So let's take a look here at one very famous instance of uh, uh, someone from Hollywood um, taking this approach, trying to avoid participating in HUAC. Um, this is Lillian Hellman, who was uh, mostly known as a playwright, but had also been a screenwriter for a number of years. Um, and when Congress, she'd also been a member of several communist-affiliated organizations. I don't want to downplay uh, her communist sympathies here. Uh, but when Congress asked her to testify to come before HUAC, she uh, wrote this letter in which she says, essentially, I'm happy to talk about myself. Uh, if you have any questions about my activities and what I've done, I'm glad to answer them. But the values I was raised with tell me <coughs> that talking about my friends and neighbors and putting them in jeopardy is the wrong thing to do. So if you want to ask questions about me, I'm happy to answer them. But my lawyer tells me, if I come before you and I don't always invoke the fifth, then I'm going to have to inform on people, and I don't want to do that. So you can tell me in advance, you're only going to ask about me, um, or I can show up and I can plead the fifth. And Huac said, you better show up and plead the fifth. Um, no, we're going to ask you about other people. That's the whole purpose, the whole reason we're doing this, is to try to uncover these networks of so-called communist sympathizers. So Lillian Hellman invokes the fifth. Uh, she actually doesn't end up having to go to Congress uh, to do this. Um, often, these sorts of negotiations happen behind closed doors. The attorneys tell them ahead of time, my client will invoke the Fifth Amendment. Sometimes they make them go through with the ceremony because they're looking for a good television moment. Other times they just put the bulletin in the newspaper, so-and-so refused to testify. 
Um, Lily Hellman, again, one of these people, uh, refuses to testify, which means she will find herself, as many people will in the early 1950s, on what we call the blacklist. Um, so again, simply for refusing to testify, not for saying, yes, I was a member of the Communist Party, not for saying, yes, I witnessed satanic rituals, right? Simply for refusing to testify, Lily and Hellman will be blacklisted from the industry. Um, no reputable uh, film studio uh, or Broadway playhouse, uh, et cetera, et cetera, would hire her. Now, blacklists operated mostly informally. There's no published list. Who act doesn't put out a list of people you can hire? Neither does McCarthy. Um, there's no formal list of who is or isn't on, uh, is, it, it is or isn't allowed to be hired. Most of the time, it happens, uh, you know, if you see someone's name in the newspaper as uh, getting called before who act as an unfriendly witness, that alone is enough of a signal to studio heads um, that you should no longer be hired. Right? In other cases, there are third-party organizations that will put together more formal lists. Um, so here we have the, the title of the lecture um, from this uh, conservative political organization, Counterattack. Um, they've been around since the mid-1940s. Um, they put out this sort of bulletin, this pamphlet. Uh, it's a small booklet in 1950, um, where they it's kind of an impressive pre-internet feat, to be honest. Um, they researched uh, dozens and dozens of people in Hollywood and found specific moments and specific ties to some sort of loosely communist-affiliated organization. So for example, Pete Seeger here um, uh, performed something called People's Songs. Um, or sorry, performed at a group called People's Songs. Um, he was a member of the Progressive Citizens of America. Uh, Notice here that being uh, supporting Wallace for president, that's uh, FDR's former vice president, Henry Wallace, who'd run as a progressive in 1948. Um, supporting him for president would be enough to get you in red channels. Pete Seeger went a little bit further. He was actually a member of the CPUSA for a while. Um, so, you know, again, there's kind of a mishmash here, right? Uh, yes, if you were a member of the Communist Party, that would get you on this list. Uh, but for, say, uh, a young actress like Marsha Hunt, um, she had three entries in Red Channels. Uh, she was also had supported Henry Wallace for president. Um, she had donated money um, uh, to a hospital relief fund during the Spanish Civil War. Um, and I'm, you know, off the top of my head, I'm blanking on the third one, but it was similarly innocuous, right? Um, but she shows up in this list, and she's up for a part, and then suddenly that part gets yanked, and she has no idea why. Initially, this was uh, just mailed to studio heads, and sort of privately circulated, and you wouldn't even necessarily know if your name appeared in this. Uh, by 1952, there was a kind of a minor scandal when it came out um, that studio heads were using these lists, um, and they denied it. And so from, you know, during this whole period, you'll have people saying there's no such thing as a blacklist, even as everyone in the country can witness that the blacklist is clearly at work, right? And they're refusing to testify before HUAC means you're not on the silver screen anymore. Um, but over and over again, people will insist there is no blacklist, there is no formal blacklist. Um, also, just to kind of note here, a couple of things which Red Channels is interested in. Um, if you were on the record talking about academic freedom, that's a little suspicious. <laughs> what are you talking about in that class that you need all that freedom for? If you're talking about civil rights, Again, lots of communists in the 30s and 40s supported civil rights. Uh, you know, it was the CPUSA that defended the Scottsboro Boys. Um, if you're talking about peace, whoa, are you talking about making a compromise with the Soviet Union? Are you questioning the development of the H-bomb and the wisdom of the Strategic Air Command? Um, are you doing that because you're trying to undermine the American war effort, right? Um, so, yeah. You know, even fairly innocuous things will get you added to red channels. All right, I mentioned Kuak was going to look for Soviet propaganda. They came up pretty short um, in their investigations of Hollywood. They did identify three films that particularly bothered them. Uh, Mission to Moscow, The North Star, and Song of Russia. Um, and I'll be really honest, if you naively watch these, if you watch them with no context given, all three of them come off a lot like Soviet propaganda. Mission to Moscow is about the uh, ambassador to the Soviet Union and the run-up to World War II, and it paints this kind of glowing picture of Stalinism. Uh, the North Star is about uh, 
heroic collective farmers, I think in the Ukraine, resisting the German invasion. Um, again, points a fairly sympathetic uh, portrayal of communism. The song of Russia is a little bit different, it's a little bit less overtly political, it's more of a romance, um, but certainly it's not critical of the Soviet Union at all. But this might be, I don't know how good this projection is. There's a little bit of a catch here, and I'm wondering if anyone has noticed something odd about these three films. Um, maybe to give it away, does anyone have any idea why the dates might explain why these films are being made? And since the type's fairly small, I'll tell you Mission to Moscow is from 1943, the North Star is from 1943, and Song of Russia is from 1944. During the war? The story of World War II, the Soviet Union is our ally in all war, right? Um, these are, in fact, three films that were approved by FDR's War Department. Um, he had asked Hollywood to produce films that would generate sympathy and support for our allies during World War II. Right? So they went looking for Soviet propaganda. They found it, um, but it was propaganda made at the behest of the American government. Uh, also, just a kind of tie-in note here, Lillian Hellman is the screenwriter here for the North Star. So. <laughs> All right, so what did Hollywood do um, to try to kind of contribute, or how did it contribute to the era of anti-communism and corruptism? Well, in the 1950s, they produced dozens of explicitly ideological anti-communist films. If you're looking for propaganda, this is propaganda. Um, the the anti-communist films produced in the 1950s uh, are incredibly ideologically loaded. Again, they show uh, communists as monsters, um, often they're like un, un, uh, unnecessarily cruel to animals. Um, communist women in particular get very bad in these films. Uh, they're treated either as like seductive sex pots who don't care about anything except luring a young man into the race of communism, um, or as sort of uh, stern, matronly, sexless feminists, right? Um, so there's a, again, these are particularly uh, denigrating of, of supposed communists. Um, uh, they produced a lot of them, like I said, uh, in 1952, uh, um, at the peak of this, they produced 12 films in a single year um, in this genre. So that's one film every month coming to the box office about the threat of communism that's just around the corner. Um, yeah, so they made a lot of these. These are mostly critically panned. I wouldn't recommend watching any of them to anyone. I've watched uh, at least 20 now. Um, it's hard to find a good one. Um, and they tended to perform poorly at the box office. They're not good movies. Um, so most of these were actually uh, financial losses for the studios, and yet they kept making them. Anyone, any guesses why? Why would you keep making these if you're losing money on them? Public relations. Yeah, I heard a voice. Who was that? All right, yeah, public relations. Yeah, very much. They are, uh, you know, they've invited HUAC to come investigate them. They've said we've proved the communists are not going to be communist propaganda. They want to be seen as a wholesome American industry. And being wholesome Americans in 1952 meant being viciously critical of communists. Okay. There is one very good anti-communist film from the period. Uh, this is On the Waterfront from 1954. Now, even though the main plot of On the Waterfront is about uh, a labor union, a, a dock workers union, um, and that would seem a natural fit for communists, uh, the villains of the film are actually presented as mobsters uh, who are running the union. Um, but the film was written by Elia Kazan, who had recently testified before HUAC, and he himself had it informed. Um, he had named names. So, um, uh, sorry about that, people who had attended meetings and that sort of thing. Um, and so the kind of central plot point of the film, the kind of climax of the film, comes when Terry, the main character, agrees to testify before this criminal commission that's investigating corruption at the docks. And he starts talking about what he's seen at the docks, uh, the corruption he's seen, the mafia involvement, etc. So there's a kind of clear parallel to Kazan himself. And this was not lost on built on uh, audiences uh, or critics at the time. Uh, most of the reviews will specifically mention the connection to Huwa. I'm going to watch one very quick clip here. Hopefully the audio works okay. Uh, this is from the last few minutes of the film. Um, 
as Terry's, uh, he, he's testified already, he comes back to the docks, and uh, now he's confronting the mobsters. He, he doesn't get hired for the day's shift, and he says, it's because I testified, and then they get into this conflict. successfully, both financially and in terms of swaying American viewers, um, not by um, demonizing communism, um, but by running uh, heavy promotions of quote-unquote American values, right? Uh, so American television in this period is dominated by family sitcoms, um, you know, Leave it to Beaver by the end of the 1950s, this kind of genre, right? So uh, emphasizing uh, domesticity and uh, the sanctity of the American family. Um, major broadcast networks at this point are broadcasting uh, religious messages. So uh, Fulton, Archbishop Fulton Sheen here, um, who had run Sheen's Catholic Radio Hour in the 1930s and through the 1940s, uh, has given a prime time spot on uh, NBC um, to broadcast his uh, sort of religious talk show once a week uh, called Life is Worth Living. And then of course, there's a sort of naked and uh, <laughs> Uh, abundant promotion of capitalism on American television, right? So of course advertisements are what's fueling the whole thing, um, but also uh, this is the heyday of the American game show, right? So the notion that anyone can uh, make it in America. If you just learn the right uh, 15 trivia facts and happen to get asked those questions when you show up, and, right, that'll be your ticket to success, right? So it's kind of selling this vision um, of uh, sort of a meritocratic system uh, where anyone can succeed. Of course, there's some irony here, I don't have time to get into this today, but the source of corruption in American film and television uh, in the 1950s was not communists. They weren't the, the ones uh, uh, sort of double dealing here. It was those uh, game shows, right, which will come out at the end of the 1950s in a series of congressional hearings uh, revealing that most of these shows at the time were rigged. Five minutes, all right, perfect. All right, one more thing to touch on here. Uh, with our few remaining minutes, is to think uh, in television we don't just have scripted television, right? We also have the televised news. Um, so how did they deal with McCarthyism and anti-communism? Well, for the most part, they didn't. Um, certainly not in any kind of critical way. Um, American television, televised news, rarely, um, rarely even touched on the question of McCarthyism. Um, and when they did, it was mostly by airing hearings uh, from HUAC. Uh, without challenge or correction or protest. Right? Um, there is one big exception, although it's a limited exception, and that's Edward R. Murrow uh, and his news program, See It Now, on CBS. Um, they did run a kind of rebuttal of McCarthy, um, but their rebuttal in itself demonstrates the problems of television in this period. So first of all, 
The sponsors refused to support it. Murrow and his producer, Fred Friendly, um, paid for the ad spots out of their own pocket. Um, they bought the advertising for the hour so they could run the show. Second, there was something, part of the reason American television had been reluctant to take up the question of McCarthyism was there was a FCC uh, regulation at the time called the Fairness Doctrine. It said if you give time, if you give airtime to something controversial, then you need to give time to the opposing side of that controversy. But in practice, this is a little bit wonky and highly subjective. Uh, what is controversial? Well, if McCarthy gets up and he says there are 305 members of the State Department who are members of the Communist Party, the network not, might not treat that as controversial at all. He's a sitting senator, he's the head of the investigatory committee, right? He's speaking with the voice of the government. Where's the controversy? On top of that, what's the other side? We don't know who those 305 people are because McCarthy won't tell us, so who's going to come on and rebut that? Right, but in Edward Murrow's case, uh, when they run this anti-McCarthyist uh, editorial piece, um, they do have to give time to McCarthy to respond. Um, the networks were reluctant to do this. They thought audiences wouldn't be interested. All right, try to move fast here because we're almost out of time. But one big moment in television history that touches on McCarthy has to do with the Army McCarthy hearings. So this is both kind of the peak and also in some ways the nadir of, of uh, at least for McCarthy himself. Um, in 1953, McCarthy had charged that the army had been infiltrated by communists. Um, and then a series of hearings over the next year uh, called a number of witnesses to investigate those charges. Um, this turned into a significant political scandal because the army pushed back and said that, in fact, McCarthy's own office was corrupt. Um, his chief counsel, Roy Cohn, had allegedly used his political influence to se secure some favors. Uh, for a male friend of his, and it's heavily suggested in the hearings that this may have been a homosexual relationship, which mm -hmm. carried its own stigma in the era. Um, so there's this whole kind of scandal brewing in the background, which had captured America's attention. NBC and CBS were airing nightly recaps of these hearings. ABC was airing the hearings unedited in real time. Um, and so Americans were seeing this come into their home. And the kind of key moment in these hearings comes when McCarthy alleges that a young lawyer um, on the army staff had been a member of something called the Lawyers Guild, which was a union which may have had distant ties uh, to the Communist Party. Uh, it was like a, a, it was a, an attempted effort to make a, a union for lawyers. It didn't work out. Uh, in any case, um, the chief counsel for the army um, rebutted that um, we knew about this. Uh, he came forward and told us this himself. Um, we revealed it to you, McCarthy. Um, we gave that information to you in Discovery, and now you're airing this dirty laundry on national television. And in this kind of famous moment, he says, um, have you no sense of decency, sir? At long last, have you no decency? And for whatever reason, whether it was um, going after the Army, which is a pretty sacred American institution, um, or if it was this kind of overreach where he was smearing people publicly on television, uh, this was essentially the end of McCarthy's career. Shortly after this, he was censured by the Senate um, and then drifted into relative political obscurity, uh, died of some kind of liver disease. He was an alcoholic. Um, so again, this is sort of the end of McCarthy's career. This kind of anti-communism, though, would stick around um, at least through the early 1960s. The Smith Act will get overturned in 1957, so you can't go to jail just for being a member of the party. Um, but the blacklist will persist until the end of the 1950s um, and into the early 1960s. Uh, HUAC will persist uh, until 1966 or so. Um, so again, even though McCarthy is gone, this is still happening at a more muted level for the remainder of the decade. All right, I'm out of time, um, so I better stop here and ask for any questions. Um, I saw your hand first. Since he was from Nebraska, can you talk about um, Robert Taylor? Oh, uh, sure. In his um, role a little bit. Um, you know, I can't talk too much about Robert Taylor. About all I know about him is that he's from Nebraska. Uh, <laughs> and that he's in a slew of films in the late 1940s through uh, the mid 1950s. He's a very talented actor. Um, but unfortunately, I don't know that much about his actor. Um, yes, ma'am. Can you give us an example of what? They would have put in a TV show that would have made us think that communism was bad. 
Oh, but, um, you know, just because I do yeah. remember watching that, and I don't remember anything. Yeah, so television tended not, um, you know, most of those kinds of like over uh, propaganda that I was referring to, mostly uh, was film, feature length films, mm -hmm. right? Um, you know, on television, there's going to be more where you get, again, rather than the kind of demonizing of communism, although that does happen, especially like on um, some uh, police procedurals in the period, uh, communists are often villains in those shows. Um, it does happen, but it's, it's fairly rare compared to film. Mostly what you see in television whoops, is more this kind of thing, right? Is the, rather than the demonizing of communism, this sort of celebration of American values, right? Um, which again is much more successful with audiences, um, both commercial, like both in terms of making money and also uh, like in persuading them to be a lot. I don't know if that helps answer your question. Well, like the, the uh, priest, did he ever say anything about? He did talk, um, Sheen, un, unlike McCarthy, some people have compared Sheen and McCarthy, and I think that comparison is somewhat unfair. Um, Sheen talked about the evils of the Soviet Union, um, particularly because he was concerned about atheism, right? Uh, the Soviet Union you know, was officially an atheist state. Um, but he, he didn't rail about this kind of threat within, right? Um, so he was on a slightly different tack than McCarthy. Maybe, uh, she like all the ghosts. Yeah, he's, yeah, he's got yeah. a little bit of a vampire vibe. <laughs> 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 Any other questions? Yep. Just briefly, uh, how does this compare to the way socialists, the socialist party was kind of a different deal? Oh, oh, how do they treat socialists in the United States? Yeah. Roughly the same. Roughly yeah. The same. Yeah, I mean, again, keep in mind this is a, a period where, um, yeah, just being a member of the Lawyers Guild is enough to cast suspicion on you, right? Um, even New Dealers uh, were under serious political scrutiny in this period. Um, it didn't help that Alger Hiss had been a prominent member of, of FDR's government and was convicted, of, technically convicted of perjury, um, but under the allegation that he had been a Soviet spy. Um, so, you know, there may have been that, that influence there. I mentioned that kind of the perception that Henry Wallace, uh, FDR's vice president, ran for you know, ran his own campaign on the Progressive Party. Right, so any kind of left-leaning politics, um, even uh, I was going to say like far left, but it doesn't have to be far left. Again, even as left as the New Deal, right, was enough to get um, at least have suspicion directed at you. Being a member of the Socialist Party or the International Workers of the World or something like that, um, you would be black. We will take it from the trigger. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Any other questions? Very interesting. Right. Thank you so much. Thank you.